Greetings. I'm Rob Redden. I happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ in Grover Beach, California, on the beautiful Central Coast. I've been coming to you through this media through throughout about two, maybe two and a half years. And I'm enjoying this work, and I hope you're enjoying it as well. Last week, we talked about exciting insights into the power of God's Word from Psalm 119. And we're just going to put the word more in front of that title and look at the psalm carefully and see what else we can learn from the writer as he extols the place of God's Word in his life. When you think about a chapter, I mean a psalm 176 verses long you realize that there's a lot there to try to comprehend and to grasp we're certainly not going through this a verse by verse study but we certainly want to focus upon some subjects that the author spends a lot of time discussing you know we don't know who wrote it we don't know when it was written scholars are all disagreeing in disagreement with one another. But the fact is, God preserved it because the Holy Spirit guided him to record it. And I'm excited to share with you more insights into the power of God's Word from Psalm 119. You know, we pointed out last week that the author uses numerous words, synonyms for the Word of God, and these serve to provide, uh, provide variety in such a long psalm. I reread the psalm and I counted 11 words. Some scholars say there are 10 and others 12, but I certainly have found 11. And a comment from a renowned Hebraist commentator of the 19th century, I think would be fitting here. Adam Clark wrote, though there be a continual reoccurrence of the same words, which would of itself prevent it from having a pleasing effect on the ear, yet these words are so connected with a vast variety of others, which show their force and meaning and still new and impressive points of light, that attention is still excited and devotion kept alive during the whole reading. It is constructed with admirable art and everywhere breathes the justest and highest tribute on the revelation of God, shows the glories of God who gave it, the necessities and dependence of his intelligent creatures, the bounty of the Creator, and the praise and obedience which are his due. It is elegant throughout. It is full of beauties. To no psalm can its own words be better applied than Psalm 119 and verse 18, Open thou mine eyes that I may... Uh, behold wondrous things out of thy law. There are a couple, two or three, maybe four points I'd like to get to today. And I'm going to pose the question, where do you go when you fear uh, about possibly yielding to temptation? First, we all have temptations to do what we know is displeasing to the Lord. In Matthew 26, 41, while Jesus was in the garden, he kept coming back to the disciples and he kept saying, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The psalmist in this psalm helps us to see that the understanding of God's word gives us the proper insight to know what to hate and how we may overcome temptation. Verse 104 says, From your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Now, this of course shake hands with Jeremiah 10.23, that it's not in man that lives to direct his own steps. So obviously the psalmist here recognizes that an understanding of, of the word of God gives one understanding of what is the false way to hate. 
And there are so many people that are ignorant of God's word that they do not hate every false way. They embrace it and celebrate it and promote it as if it is okay. Verse 133, establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. This is very important. We may stumble and fall because we are not aware of the stumbling blocks put before me by Satan, by the world and his servants. In order to have our footprints established, it must be established by God's word. And therefore, ignorance of God's word not only is it not any excuse, but it is a recipe for disaster in our attempts to live following the path that leads to eternal life. And so establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. If we know that there is a sin that will dominate us and enslave us, we need to pray to God, establish my footsteps in your word, dear God. And that will not only give us God's blessings, but we also are motivated to be into his word and store up God's word that we may not sin against him. Do you know seven times in this psalm, he says he will not forget God's word in verse 16. Notice the different synonyms for God's word connected with his thought. He would not forget God's word, verse 16, as we've said. In verse 33, he wouldn't forget the statutes of God. In verse 93, he would not forget the precepts of God. In verse 109, he would not forget God's law. And then in verse 176, he would not forget the commandments of the Lord. These are not different things. They are embracing all of God's word with regard to his will for you and me. And so he won't forget it. But you can't forget something that you have not learned. You can't forget something that you don't have to forget. So when he prays, that God would prevent him from forgetting the word of God. He knows the word of God. He has spent time in God's word. He knows what God wor God's word says. He knows what God wants for him. And therefore, he prays that his behavior, that his lifestyle will be so guarded and that he would be not distracted where he would forget God's word. And it's easy to forget if we don't keep our eyes in the word and embrace it if we can't memorize it word for word at least get the thought in our heads what god is saying and how could he forget because he says in verse 11 in your word i have treasured in my heart that i might not sin against you doesn't this remind you of paul's statement in first corinthians 10 and verse 13 now, he's not talking about the trials of life. In this context, context, he's talking about the temptation to sin. Read the chapter, the previous verses, and see that this is not talking about the trials of heartaches, tragedy, illness, loss of loved ones, afflictions. He's talking about temptation to sin. And he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, nothing's going to afflict you with temptation that hasn't been felt by others as well. And God is faithful. Paul says, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear? There is no excuse for someone to say, God, you allowed me to be tempted above my strength. That is impossible because God says here that you won't be tempted above 
what you're able to, uh, to bear. But with that temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. God will answer our prayers. God will lead us away from temptation if we have a word of God about the matter, consciously able to use it in them in those moments. But what would happen in, if we yielded to temptation? Does the psalmist have anything to say about that? The last verse says it all. In 176, he says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Several things may be implied here. Now, he's not oblivious to the commandments of God, but yet there's a possibility that he could slip and go astray. Now, you know, one thing that stands out in the psalm until the last verse is very little confession is made by the psalmist about his sin. There's scattered verses, yes, and his critics claim that there is a self-righteousness present, but this is wrong. The psalmist ends with a note of an awareness of his own sin and his own failures and admits to his own wandering like a lost sheep. We too, like the psalmist, must admit to the Lord that we have wandered away from time to time. This is not a total abandonment of God, but a slip, a stumble. This is the conclusion of everything he's written concerning the power of God's word. And he says, Lord, you take control of me, for I haven't forgotten you or your word. From time to time, a Christian loses his way. The sheep lost knows it's lost and will wander away in fear. But once it hears the shepherd's voice, he turns and follows the shepherd, as Jesus promised in John 10. You know, in Luke 13, pardon me, in Luke 15, there are three parables about a lost boy, a lost sheep, and a lost coin. The lost son was lost. He knew he was lost, and he knew his way back to the Father. The lost sheep knew it was lost, but does not know the way back to the flock. The lost coin does not know it's lost, certainly does not know how to return to the rightful owner, God. These parables present every picture of those who stray from the Lord. Some of us are like the boy, others are like the sheep, and needs guidance from God's word. And some are like the coin. When we recall the teachings of God's word, we then ascend to the place of a sheep, or from the place of the sheep to that of the lost son, and we know how to return after we fall. So once again, when we stumble, we still turn to God, in prayer, being led by the word of God, and certainly follow that instruction as God tugs us back into the fold. Now, does God have a purpose in our trials and afflictions? This is my third point. And as we study the psalm, we discovered that this man, this author, this servant of the Lord was going through all kinds of afflictions and suffering, some by his fellow man, his enemies, who wished him harm. Now, first I want to say, it wasn't God who brought the evil in this world, but man's rebellion against God in the garden. God warned that sin had consequences, and physical death and all that is involved in bringing this about was man's own doing. And the Garden Rebellion is a microcosm, a miniature world of the whole world, of all who reach the age of accountability when we become responsible for our sin. But you know, God is not defeated by the evil of pain and suffering or all the things that we are heir to. 
but he will use it if we allow him to bring some good out of it. And of course, this reminds me of Romans 8, 28. And it certainly harmonizes with the psalm. If you don't remember what Romans 8, 28, let me remind you. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those that love God, to, call, uh, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now let's look at the psalm. In verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. All right? Once again, we can see how important the word of God is. But also we can see the benefit of his affliction. He refocused upon the commandments of God. And in essence, he was a better servant after his afflictions than he was before. And how many of us can say amen to that? that we are better servants now, having come through suffering and loss than we were before. In verse 71, he says, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. It's certainly really amazing how this happens. I remember visiting an aged sister who was in the hospital, and finally died, but she had a lengthy illness, hospitalized for quite some time. And I was talking to her, and she said to me, you know, I've been recently reading the book of Palms. Yes, you heard me right. Somewhere along the line, she didn't get the right pronunciation of the book of Psalms. But what I gained from that was that she was beginning for the first time to read the book of Psalms because of her suffering. No, I didn't correct her. It didn't matter. What mattered was she was reading the book of Psalms. In verse 75, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. In 107, he says, I'm exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Now, here is something that we need to grasp. What God allows, he takes credit, either good or ill, because ultimately, he is the sovereign of the universe and nothing will, nothing will overcome his plans. Isaiah 45, 7 says, according to the old American standard, God makes peace and creates evil. Now that Hebrew word for evil here has a variety of nuances expressing distinct shades of meaning. The new American standard update gives 13 different words to translate this word, while the translators of the King James Version used two dozen English words. So you can see that it had a variety of nuances, and each context helps determine the right meaning for that particular verse or that particular occurrence. In this context, the word is used opposite piece. This is only in the sense that he allows the calamities of life for his purposes. It is within his permissive will that evil is allowed in the world because of a just punishment against sin. So yes, the author claims that God afflicted him in faithfulness. In our understanding, it means that God allowed these afflictions because of the good that would come from them as acknowledged by the author. You know, if we do not look upon these things as a means of disciplining us, like a wise child understands his father's discipline, Hebrews chapter 12, then of course no good can come from one who is oblivious to the faithfulness of God. So we've got to ask ourselves, do our trials 
make us bitter or better? For the psalmist, better. For you and me, hopefully, better. If we understand the value of trials through God's word, we should be better. You know, to change the subject a little bit, my first, uh, fourth point is this. The psalmist refused to pick and choose what commandments to obey. But what about you and me? Notice how encompassing are God's words to him. In verse 6, I have respect for all your commandments. Verse 13, with my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. Do you remember what Paul said to the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20? In verse 20, he told them how while he was there, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. And in verse 26 and 27, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel or the whole purpose of God. Notice how many times the writer uses that word all. Again, 86, all your commandments are faithful. Verse 128, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. Verse 151, all your commandments are truth. Verse 172, all your commandments are righteousness. And no wonder in verse 160, he says the sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. You see, this guards us as it guarded him against the selective deductive studies that we so often see today. By this, I mean that we simply focus upon one thing and we try to find everything that is taught about that one thing and we think that that's all there is to the matter. We cannot simply read a passage and claim that that is all there is in the Bible about the subject. For example, there were times when Jesus told people to repent. He didn't say a word about believing. Luke 13, 3 and 13, 5. Did that make believing unessential? And at times, he told people to believe, but didn't mention repenting. John three sixteen, for example. Does that mean a person can believe in Jesus and not change his life? Repent of sin? But at times, we even find baptism is commanded when faith and repentance isn't even mentioned. Acts twenty two sixteen, Paul was told to arise and be baptized and wash away of sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Is there one mention? of faith and repentance there? What about um, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, where it says the like figure of the flood of Noah? Baptism even saves us. Where's the mention of faith and repentance there? Can a person just dip him, get dipped in water and be baptized and not believe and not repent? You see what I'm trying to say here? We cannot pick and choose the commandments to obey. The Bible tells us to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17, and that without faith we cannot please God, 11, Hebrews 11 verse 6. And that we are told to repent of our sins, as we have mentioned, and also in Acts 17, 30 and 31. And we are told to be baptized, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16. 
and other like and similar verses. Let me illustrate this. Psalm 139, verse 17, has the same word as the word some in verse 160. Here, the expression, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Is that sum, S-O-M-E, or sum, S-U-M? It is S-U-M, the sum total. Just as we understand that God's thoughts are complete, so we must search and find the sum of God's teaching on any subject in the Bible. This would be a whole lesson, but I wanted to introduce you to this very important vital principle. So we come full circle and return to Adam Clark's quotation of verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold the wonderful things of your law. I hope these two lessons have stirred your desire to make Bible reading and study a part of your daily activities. If you have any questions about anything you read, I would be happy to explore the possible answers with you. At least I would do my best. You can respond at our web page, groverbeachchurchofchrist.com, or I think you can respond to YouTube, but you can contact me direct, R-R-E-D-D-E-N-604 at AOL. AOL.com. That's my email address. Let me give it to you again. R-R-E-D-D-E-N-6-0-4 at AOL.com. Remember this saying. I have given it to you several times. This book, the Bible, will keep you from sin. But sin will keep you from this book. Let's pray. Holy God, Father in heaven, we extol your word because it is perfect and it reveals to us where we fail you, where, where we obey you, and where our destiny will be. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your long-suffering. And we pray, dear God, that we will not take these things for granted. And we pray, dear Lord, that your word will dwell in our hearts, and that it will lift us up to praise you and glorify you, our God in heaven. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in, and I hope you'll be back next week when we explore God's word. And we will not, of course, end this message without encouraging you to meet with your church family on the Lord's Day. And now this is my prayer that God may bless you and keep you until we meet again. Goodbye.